Welcome everybody. Make sure you've got your food ready and find yourself a seat. We're going to get started just now. Welcome to the Frank Ratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry. My name is Harrison Apple. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the associate director of the studio. Um, go ahead and raise your hand for me if this is your first visit to the studio. Oh, wonderful. I love this. This is great. The rest of you, old hat. Don't care anymore. Um, no, welcome, and it's really nice to see the rest of you again. Um, we have so much programming coming down the pike this fall, and I know that you'll be excited for all of it, but this is the first big event that we're getting to share with you, so thank you for making this such a good crowd. The exits are located in the front where you entered, as well as one emergency exit in the back of the room, and for your convenience, note that there are bathrooms on A level and also directly above us. Um, there is a gender-neutral restroom directly above us and gendered ADA-accessible bathrooms on the first level. To situate this gathering, we are on the traditional lands of many people, including the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, and Haudenosaunee, whose relationships with the land continue to this day through long-haul stewardship. The studio was founded in 1989 as the Carnegie Mellon Center for Art and Technology in what had been the College of Fine Arts Library. And in our contemporary moment, the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry is a venue, it's a classroom, it's a commons, and a laboratory for atypical, transdisciplinary, and interinstitutional research at the intersection of arts, science, technology, and culture. Core to the studio's mission are the students, the staff, and the faculty, as well as the invited scholars and artists that find support and inspiration in our space. The studio and its current iteration is composed of myself, Linda Hager, Bill Rogers, Nicka Ross, Carol Hernandez, and Anna Jungnell Wagner, as, long as, uh, as well as our uh, stalwart studio monitors who are helping record tonight, including M. Lugo and Darius Scott. So thank you so much for letting me welcome you to this very particular place. I'm going to hand it off to Wendy Ahrens, who is in charge of this event. Thank you, Harrison. Hi, all. Um, I'm really, really happy to be kicking off our Dinner and a Movie uh, series again this year. My name is Wendy Ahrens. I'm the director for the Center for the Arts and Society, which has uh, produced these events as a way of creating community and conversation around the threatened scholars in our community. Um, in addition to tonight's screening, which was curated by visiting professor of Afghan cinema and theater, Habib Saroj, um, we're also going to have another event on October 25th, um, a film screening also that will be curated by Reem al and uh, there will be more on that soon, but please hold that date um, because uh, we're going to have a really exciting program for that. Um, I hope you are all enjoying the delicious food prepared by our friends um, at Alibaba, which is a restaurant on Craig Street. Those of you who attended these events last year may, be remem may remember that for our Afghan film, we had catering supplied by Zafaran, which was a catering business run by Afghan women living here in Pittsburgh. And sadly, they are no longer in business. And it turns out that they were the only Afghan caterer in town. So we decided to ask Ziad from Alibaba to cater for us again because their food is so good and we knew that they would take really good care of us. And we do recognize that the cuisines and the cultures are very different, <laughs> but uh, we hope that you find that the food is delicious nonetheless. And perhaps and someday in the future there will be another Afghan caterer here in Pittsburgh. Uh, before I turn the mic over to Habib to introduce our guest tonight, um, I first of all I want to thank John Rubin, who's been my partner in crime uh, in organizing these events. He does an enormous amount of work, in, you know, helping us to put this together. So thank you, John. I also want to thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Frank Ratchy Studio for Creative Inquiry, which uh, you know not only gave us the space but has also helped us out with you know the recording of the event and the setup. Um, and then also the Humanities Scholars Program, Kim and Eric Geiler Humanities Lecture Fund, um, which has contributed to co-sponsoring this event. Um, so now I want to hand it over to Habib Sarosh, and he will introduce the film and the filmmaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our program. And uh, thank you all for your joining us. Uh, I am Hab Habib Surush, professor, a professor, a screenwriter, and playwright. Uh, for 10 years, I was uh, a professor at Kabul University in the Faculty of Fine Arts. And now I am a visiting researcher in the School of Drama and Art 
theory at uh, Carnegie Mellon University. First, I am really thankful for support and assistance of Carnegie Mellon University and also thank you for everything and this uh, university help and support me a lot everywhere and uh, every time. When I have been in Afghanistan, I have experienced a lot of bad situation with the support of uh, Carnegie Mellon University, I was able to forget the bad situation and terrible situation I spent in Afghanistan as a writer and uh, uh, artist. And also I would like to give a special thanks for three people Professor John Rubin, Professor Wendy, and Miss Alexandra Henneker, who always help and support me everywhere and every time. These three people, these three people believed in me and gave me motivation and hope and helped me uh, regain my self-confidence and hope. And it is so important for me to continue my uh, career path with strength. And finally, thank you so much, Dr. Sahra Karimi, for accepting our invitation. I don't like talk more I just want to share a brief biography of Sahra Karimi with you. Sahra Karimi is a highly accomplished film director, scriptwriter, and professor. She previously served as a director general of Afghan film. She has an impressive background in the field of cinema with a PhD in feature films directing and screenwriting. During her studies, she directed numerous short, film, short fiction and uh, documentary films, many of which gained international uh, recognition and were broadcast by esteemed European TV channels. Her documentary, Afghan Woman Behind the Wheel, received around 25 awards at major film festivals worldwide. Additionally, her film, Light Breeze, was honored at, uh, as the Best short fiction film by the Slovak Film and TV Academy. In 2019, Sahra Karimi's debut feature film, Hawa Mariam Ayesha, premiered at the Venice Film Festival and uh, represented Afghanistan at the Oscars. The film has participated in over uh, 50 film festivals globally and has been broadcast by numerous European TV channels. Currently, Sahra Karimi is working on her second feature film, Fight from Kabul, which is based on true events. Thank you so much. Hi, all. Um, so we have the filmmaker here, Sara Karimi. And uh, Habib is going to moderate the Q&A. Um, but I want to say just be, we're, we have this room until about 8 o'clock. Um, and we have takeout containers. So as you leave, please also take food with you. But don't leave yet because you're going to have questions and want to talk to Sara. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was... Great. Thank you very much. 
Any questions? And I'm going to walk around with this mic. Just raise your hand. And ask your question with the microphone, please. Or I will wait for the questions. It's fine. Okay, you have a question. <laughs> Do you have a question to start off? Oh, yes, I got it. So thank you for the beautiful film and for being here. Um, I was so um, interested in the visual beauty and the carefulness of the the way that so many things in the women's homes and their hair and the colors were so carefully constructed. Is this, uh, is this unique to the way that you approach your films? Um, hi, everybody. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me here. And thank you very, very much for screening, screening my film. Thank you, Suresh Saeb and everybody. Uh, I studied filmmaking in uh, Eastern Europe. So the Eastern European filmmaking style is very, very visible in my product. Also, I don't know, it was so, so accidentally that I wanted to go to fiction film directing but they couldn't they didn't open that year uh, so i end up to do documentary mm. so i studied documentary film for uh, for three years and then uh, in the same time i studied fiction film uh, the second is i i I'm very much influenced by poetry. I love poetry, I write poetry, I write a lot. Also, because uh, I was the last child of my parents in very old age, I was very lonely, so I am very good in being lonely and being ob observe a lot, I observe a lot. So all these things from my personal and professional life somehow shows in my films that I, I, I take time, I look at people, and uh, I just show them as they are. The other thing is that I am an academic person also, so I know what does it mean picture, how you work with picture, how you work with audiovisual image to attract attention of audience. Mm -hmm. I wanted so much because it is so totally different story from different country, from different culture. Uh, even it is about everyday life, it is about everyday struggle, but I believe that many people, they don't know nothing about us. Uh, they they know mostly fragments of news from our country through media, but they didn't have this time or this opportunity to look at us profoundly and in the same time with more detail. So for me, as an artist, as a filmmaker, and especially a female filmmaker from that region, it is kind of communication tool, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my film, my stories. So for that, I just started to do this film, even it is a very, it is about womanhood, motherhood, about issue of women, which is very universal. I started so much to put uh, many elements of my culture and take time. I'm sorry I talk a lot, I'm teacher, you know? <laughs> <laughs> teacher, teachers talk a lot. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I was very moved by your film. Um, and in addition to the visual beauty, um, I also noticed that the only, the only music that you had in the film was the cell phones. And um, this sort of absence of a soundtrack um, 
how should I say? I thought it was very powerful, and I, I wonder if you can say more about your choice of having it be a a movie without a soundtrack. I, um, I know that um, in uh, from theoretical point of view, music is very good for a film because it's cooperate to tell a story, of course, to give this strength to dramatic side of the film. I usually don't use music, and. Um, even, even, I write every single thing with music. Whatever I do, I write, or whatever I do, I need to listen to music. This is, but I don't use that music in my work so much. I don't know why. Maybe because, um, okay, it, al it also came from my personal experience. When I went to film school, uh, I was just 18, 18, 19, and all my classmates, everybody, they had everything. They had their equipments, they had everything. I was a refugee, I didn't have anything. So most of, most of the time, uh, I was uh, at school. I think I lived 10 years of my life in editing room, in a school, everywhere, every corner, like this, like everybody knows me. So for me, the sound of atmosphere, it's so much important to describe also part of the story. You know? Even today, that I'm 38 years old, Sometimes I just sit and I just talk with with uh, with things because I believe that they hear me and I believe that I hear them. So this kind of personal things experience somehow um, help me a lot, like to to also to to address my also my own way of visual audiovisual um, like storytelling but also i'm very much under influence of japanese and chinese classic films and those films are very important in details and in atmos atmospheric sound and i don't know what else i should <laughs> tell but even in my new film, which I'm going to do, I'm now struggling with my producer, which is Italian, and they like so much music, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I, don't, I want to convince him, I don't want the music. And he says, no, you should use music. This is the most famous composer, Italian composer. He wants to make music for your film, but I said, no, I don't want music. So now I'm struggling to, it is maybe method of my, my filmmaking also in the same, but I like that you, you recognize it. You, you just understand it. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. um, I noticed that despite the very uh, dramatic themes of the film. You you inject some physical comedy in certain parts, like uh, the first woman uh, eventually set, uh, setting off all of the traps, or the second woman uh, uh, throwing out the 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 flowers. Um, and it just it reminded me of very physical comedy of like early Hollywood. And I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, your thoughts behind the comedy in the film. Uh, I think, uh, you know, as a filmmakers and artists in general and filmmakers in particular, we bring, uh, uh, when, we, we, when we make films, we use our personal experiences. And uh, maybe, some issues that we want to address or to highlight or something. You see me now, okay, me, like me. Do you think that I have a very beautiful life? 
If I tell you what happened to me all <laughs> at least past <laughs> 10 months, okay, <laughs> you, would, you would ask that, why you, leave? why you continue to leave? Okay, many things happened, even from since 2021 August. About my, particularly about me, I lost many, many things, like not just country, everything. Every month I, l I lose somebody, something, something. My only way to survive is to just to take it easy. Otherwise, you cannot continue. Because this life is so F difficult. <laughs> if you are in academic <laughs> location, okay, we cannot use those words. I think comedy, any kind of comedy, even a very light comedy in storytelling is very good to save that story. You don't need to put comedy as a like, oh, ha, 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 ha. You don't need. You use comedy as an irony. You use comedy as a metaphor. You use comedy as a kind of shine of, okay, hope. in this vast hopelessness, a sign of hope, you know? So for me, for that, ah, this is my second film, Flight from Kabul, not Fight from Kabul, Flight from Kabul, okay. <laughs> <laughs> flight from Kabul is tragedy. Like, uh, according Aristoteles, is a, the <laughs> so tragic. But it's full of comedy. You just laugh. Because sometimes you address the most important, significant issues through comedy. Billy Wilder, something like Americans, filmmakers, see his films. Or Chap Charlie Chaplin. Or even, I don't know, maybe some of you don't like Woody Allen. That's he and others. Comedy is such a good thing. Don't leave it alone and <laughs> just keep it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, thank you for such a beautiful film. It was visually beautiful. Um, I really love the scene of the last woman and her silhouette walking down with the wind. It was just absolutely beautiful, uh, not to mention the ending. Um, the question I have, I want to um, extend a question that was asked about the cell phone. Uh, I didn't r really recognize until uh, it was mentioned that the cell phone was this theme that tied all the women together. Can you speak a little bit about that, your, I think, intentionality behind using the I cell phone? I think cell phone is, uh, if we don't believe it or if we don't maybe notice it, it is part of our life and p part of the modern life, especially. It is a, somehow a character. Even in our very personal life, it is a character. It is our friend. Sometimes it is our very, very, very best friend, okay? Telephone, that is our cell phone. If somebody discover our cell phones, they will discover us. <laughs> they, they will know a, a lot about us, about our hidden secrets, because we messaging, sending p videos, pictures, whatever, okay? This is in general. I wanted to show that if you see all of these women, they have a smartphones, just how uh, she has just uh, ordinary. It is a very indirect sign of modernity, indirect sign of, okay, uh, like kind of another way of communication, another way of communication that seems that you uh, deliver your message or you, 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 you do your conversation, you think that you, are, you, are, you have a conversation, but there is a distance all, all the time. Because the cell phone itself, I'm not going to say it in very philosophical way or something, but the cell phone itself, it is a, it is a wall between us. Even we think that, okay, I send a message, I just kill her 
okay, I kill him. I just send him the, the most beautiful, so, but it is still a wall, it's a barrier. The other thing is that I wanted to show, this film is not about being poor, being from Afghanistan, or it is about middle class in Afghanistan, and women that they are in the middle class. And they can, with these people that they have issue, like husband, like boyfriend, like you know, hus the, the husband Farid that he's absent, they use the last, okay, the most modern communicative tool to talk about a very traditional thing. You know, it is a, they use possibility of technology to communicate a very, very traditional things that, that already have been solved somewhere else, but in that country still women, they are, they are stalking. And phones, telephones are character in my film. The ringing. We, we don't hear people that from that side. We just hear them. For example, in Mariam, telephone is totally, totally, somehow, in episode of Mariam, totally is something that really any Farid exists, or she's just talking to herself. And the only husband that we see is in, the, in Hawa, but still, even they are facing to each other, they, they, it is like the other order, but the face to face, not from phone, but face to face. You know, this kind of, I tried my, my best to use this kind of like metaphorical uh, meaning just to show that sometimes technology doesn't work, doesn't help those societies that they are stuck in tradition. Even the, mo the modern, modern, modern technology, if you just put now and send many AI something <laughs> creature, they don't help Afghanistan, especially that very patriarchal, anti-woman, a very traditional, and very, very male-dominated um, uh, society. I hope I could explain. I explained so long, that's okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, hello. Ah, uh, hello. <laughs> uh, this is one of my friends that ad ad I admire him so much. Okay, thank you very much for coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, now I'm afraid to speak in English in front of him because he's so good. And I have accent. <laughs> yes. Hi. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you so much for your film. Really, thank really you. incredible. Um, uh, just also to pick up on um, his points around humor and how you spoke about the necessity for humor um, in terms of its capacity to. Uh, inject a kind of hope within the depth of tragedy. Um, at the same time, I wonder about it because by the end of the film, it seems like, you know, whether a repressed woman or a modern woman, they all end up in the same room, in the same place. And whether there's, um, I wonder if there's anything in the film that's alluding to a, an inevitability even through biology perhaps, um, you know, where the consequences of womanhood are also that profound, you know, the consequence of it that no matter what the trajectories of one's womanhood is, there's still the capacity to end in the same room. Uh, I'm afraid going to, I'm very direct person, but I'm afraid to, so, to tell it like so loudly because 
It is very um, womanhood and motherhood, especially motherhood. It is a, the best, the best gift that we women we 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 got, we received from God, or from somebody, God or whatever, but from somebody. Okay. I believe it is something that so much we can talk about it. But in the same time, motherhood is the biggest enemy for women. The biggest. It can, motherhood can give you millions, millions, millions reason to continue the most difficult times, but also give you, gives you millions, millions reason, reason to stop. It's so, so, so complicated, this motherhood. And I think motherhood is the same everywhere. But the level of, the level of how we how we handle that motherhood and how we somehow live with the, that motherhood in different culture, in different countries, under different circumstances, in different systems, in different cultural backgrounds is, is, dif is different, but it's the same. Do you think that, do you have a child? Two, two ch you love your child. You are from America. Okay, Tehran, okay, no. But by the way, you are from a different culture, okay? You love and you will die for your children. This woman is from Afghanistan, the same. That woman is from, I don't know, New York is the same. That woman is from Africa is the same. Motherhood is the same. But I had this opportunity to travel a lot around Afghanistan. I think... Um, my, my, my friends, my girlfriends especially, they're so jealous of me. They say that, you know, you lived Afghanistan so much. You just traveled everywhere. You just walk everywhere. Because it's method of my, like, somehow a storytelling. I need to observe. I went to the north of Afghanistan. I went to south of Afghanistan. I went to the very remote corner of Afghanistan. I spoke with very, very traditional women of Afghanistan. I spoke with very liberated women of Afghanistan. I came to, that, to this conclusion. As long as you live in a very patriarchal society, as long as you live under the umbrella of anti-woman society, as long as you are part of a society that they don't respect you as a woman, it doesn't matter you read Hegel, it doesn't matter you cook the best cookie, it doesn't matter you are white, it doesn't matter you are black, it doesn't matter you have a green eyes, you will end under the same roof when you face with the same issue which is motherhood. So. The last scene in my film, somehow it was my understanding about those five, six years of traveling around Afghanistan. That women of Afghanistan, even they, they, they get this opportunity, even they go to universities, even they, they get educa edu education, even they, they are empowered, everything, but unfortunately, the patriarchal society, majority of society that are patriarchal, they don't let them to go ahead with their dreams, with their plans, with their, like, any kind of program that they have in, in their head and in their heart, you know? This is about Afghanistan. Look, what happened today in Afghanistan? It is so clear that the Taliban, the very terrorist group, the very anti-woman, the very traditional, 
I don't know, I can find thousand words to just describe how much the Taliban are bad, okay? When they came back to power, I'm not going to talk about politics, but we, when they came back to, to power, today Afghan women cannot go to school. Today Afghan women cannot go to work. Today Afghan women cannot exist, breathe freely. Because of what? Because of those, I'm so sorry, assholes that they don't believe in any, any human rights and woman rights in particular. They don't let this woman to, to live normally. Do you think, okay, I become very emotional when it, I, it comes to Afghanistan. Do you think that we don't have talent? Do you think that we don't know how to manage our life like we Afghan women? We are the most talented women in the world, I believe. I so much believe if somebody like Afghan women, they were living under those circumstances that we lived in past 20 years, they would give up. They would sit down and say, okay, I'm not going to continue. But we, every single day we woke up and we continued our life because we believed in ourselves, because we believed that we will be the next generation of mother that we are not going to give birth to terrorists. We are not going to give birth to, to, to men or to women that they are not value life in its profound meaning. But they don't let us because of the patriarchal society, because they are afraid of educated women, because they are afraid of emancipated women. I believe strongly that women of Afghanistan can save Afghanistan from this misery that we are facing right now. If women of Afghanistan stay imprisoned, if women of Afghanistan stayed silent, if women of Afghanistan stayed not go, going to school, not working, you will see the future of that country. We women, even everywhere in the world, they try to somehow stop us in different way, different way, different way, but we are who give meaning to this life. We are who giving children to this life. Without us, there is no nation. So a wise woman an, an educated woman, I'm sh so sure will not have a stupid son or a stupid girl. I'm very sure. Sorry, I don't know. It was about motherhood. I, I said I'm teacher, you know. I talk a lot. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. And we, uh, it's been decided we have one last question. Yeah, Sorry. thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome, Sarajan, to Th Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not a question, but probably a comment. Uh, what I realized in this movie is that uh, women are not voiceless who, should, who would need a savior. Um, at lots of literature has been produced in the last 20 years when the U.S. invaded Afghanistan and the pretext of saving Afghan women. The invasion happened for that sake. The whites are protecting the someone who is non-white. But what you see in this movie is, of course, women are victim of so many structural difficulties, but at the same time, they have their agency. They can decide for themselves. It's ultimately them deciding about their life. And they have voices, they can protest. Probably you can speak about that. How do you see Afghanistan's women, a woman with full agency, 
who doesn't need someone else to protect them, but they are themselves. Okay, I didn't want to talk about politics, but let's talk, okay? <laughs> I am so proud of women of Afghanistan. You know why? Because all war try to somehow engage with the Taliban. U.S. respect, I respect, I am here, okay, what? But U.S. government, politicians, they decided to have a, this shameful deal with the Taliban because there were some agenda games behind. I'm not going to talk about that because I don't understand myself what is going on behind. Our neighbors, they are trying to intervene in our issues, okay? China is so much want to help Afghanistan, and I don't know, Iran, Pakistan, everybody. But women of Afghanistan didn't give up. They are demonstrating from day one against the Taliban, inside Afghanistan, outside of Afghanistan. They use any kind of demonstration solution, hunger strike, going to, 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 to streets, going to prison, writing articles, making movies, making music, going to universities, talking there, talking uh, somewhere. They don't give up. And we, they push this very powerful war, world, not easily recognize the Taliban. Because if women of Afghanistan were silent, the world would recognize the Taliban. Believe me. Because business must go on. Today, even Afghan women are just like we are few. Even we don't have many supporters. Even feminist, feminist organization, UN, UN women, I don't know all those women that they are so much uh, care about women issue. They ignore us. They ignore our voice. They ignore our, dem our demonstration. But women of Afghanistan didn't give up. So I am sure that we will win, Mr. Saad, we will win. I'm sure that we will go to that, to that land, that promising land. I'm very sure. I'm sure that this dark time will pass. It, th it will be thanks to women of Afghanistan because they have their voice. And it is because the new generation of Afghan women who grown up during past 20 years, they are not any, any more supporting these women with burqa, women with like just waiting and begging for, begging for bread. No, the narrative of Afghanistan is not narrative of beggars. It is not. It is the narrative that the world w wants to create about us but it is not our narrative. The narrative of Afghanistan is the promising youth, men and women. Look, this professor, visiting professor here, do you think he had a very easy life in Afghanistan? No. He belongs to ethnic minority, in Afghanistan, it is very difficult if you belong to ethnic minority. You, you, you should face every single discrimination to achieve your dream. But he was a professor there. And he's here, and he's trying again. Do you think it is very easy to start from, the, from scratch? No. So we are, not going, we are not going to just be silent, Mr. Saad, as you yourself. Since you left Afghanistan, how many study articles and everything you just created your, by your own? 
We are going to continue. But I would like to thank. Because whatever happened to us, we, never, we shouldn't forget to thank. Even, even US government <laughs> did miserable things to us, but people of America are so kind. Many of you, you supported many of us, universities especially, that some of our, the most promising educated people can continue their academic life. Thank you. Thank you not supporting wrong political approaches. Thank you for supporting the humanity. Thank you for supporting these people that they really lost everything. And thank you for showing my film. Thank you for continuing showing other films. Yeah, I, I hope no, you should must. You are here to show it. <laughs> yeah, remember, remember, okay? Yeah. There is a reason always behind Okay, that we survived. Yeah. We are messengers. We are ambassadors of our stories. We are ambassadors of our culture. I will make the second film and you will invite me again, okay? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> okay, thank you so much for everything here. Yeah, I hope. Uh, to organize another event, okay? Yeah, and uh, I will invite Sahra again. Thank you so much. <laughs>